Scott Horton. I'm looking forward to a night of wisdom, insight, hilarity, passion, you know. It should be fun. I also will be watching the chat room. <laughs> it should be great. We're counting on you guys. <laughs> All right. you know, hey, so, yeah, welcome to our show. It's Eye on the Empire with me, Scott Horton, and him, Jeffrey Tucker. Tell them about yourself there for a minute, Jeff. I am he. I uh, the, 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 uh, Jeffrey Tucker, jeffreytucker.me, liberty.me, CLO, uh, digitaldevelopmentfee.org, uh, writer of uh, summaries and introductions, Leslie Fair books, and I don't know what else. You know, just d doing the thing. Um, these days, you know, causing a lot of trouble by uh, apparently opposing uh, Trump against, you know, the, the uh, mainline bourgeoisie of the GOP, which is in a, in a nationalistic, fascistic frenzy that's out of control. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And I'm the editor of antiwar.com, and I do a radio show where I interview journalists about the wars. That's basically that's, it. That's, that's 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 you're so clear. I mean, who's more believable, you or me? I mean, you clearly have a more compelling, you know, sort of reductionist uh, Biograph biographical scholarship. Yeah. So. yeah. Okay. That's, so, I, that's fine. I have a I have a I have a I have a profound question, and it, it occurred to me today, as I was driving along the road for no particular reason. Um, the U.S. is losing its status as the world economic superpower. You know, the rise of China. You know, uh, uh, you know, India, the Far East. You know, global prosperity spreading all over the world uh, for the first time in you know, a hundred years, the U.S. is now being challenged fundamentally. Uh, um, we've got, in, we got you know, U.S. incomes on the decline now 20, 30, 40 years, I don't know, of uh, stagnant U.S. incomes, you know, a lot of resentment. But, but basically, you know, you, you've, you've got so, so that deep cultural presumption that's been alive for a hundred years that we're number one. And uh, that we get to dictate the terms that nobody you know, nobody can beat us. You know, it's us versus the world. We're masters of the universe. This can't last that much longer, if, if it's even alive now. So I'm just wondering, uh, in light of that, it, uh, how much do you think that this, this, what strikes me as like a very obvious reality, is, is playing into the politics of the moment? The, you know, the, the sort of the, the sense of, of weirdo, panic that you're getting at the core of American political life today with the support for, for Sanders, you know, for Trump, you know, the, the sort of screaming desire to, you know, reconstitute the uh, American greatness in some, in some way. I mean, do you think these things are in, in some, to some extent related? Oh yeah, that's absolutely the core of it. You know, it. it's economic insecurity. Now I'm not so sure about the relative economic power of America versus the European Union, uh, China, uh, India, the BRICS, and whatever, because of course they've got plenty and plenty of government, lots and lots of government in, in those societies too, and, and sure. major distortions in their economies as well. And so, you know, I don't know. We have huge distortions here, but we're working off uh, a very sound base of an economy here. There are a lot of factories, a lot of educated people, a lot of yeah, pretty good highways here. You know what I mean for distribution. So, yeah, but um, I mean, the, I don't think but, it's a matter of oh no, China's rising because you know who cares about that? What they make a great scapegoat. What matters is is that people don't feel like they can take care of themselves. You know, um, I read uh, William Grider uh, it wrote the Washington Post version of the case against the Fed. I guess uh, the secrets of the temple. Uh, back in the no. 1980s about the Volcker term. And, sure. and and he's writing pro-inflation and against Volcker for raising interest rates is basically his message. But anyway, the point is, he talks about how they keep the statistics of, uh, you know, bankruptcies and for that matter of broken marriages and suicides and foster care and all the rates of the damage done by their economic policies. And they know that it's their responsibility and they look at that. And I mean, you know me, I'm the same as you, uh, constantly online reading the news and especially in 2008 and, or, you know, end of 08 through 2009 and 10, it's just constant in the AP news wires, man kills family, then self just over and over and over and over again. Cause these guys, they thought they were doing everything right. They worked hard this whole time. And then it turned out 
you know, their family can't rely on them after all. They get completely depressed. They, they blame themselves 100%. Have no idea about the forces arrayed against them in the world, you know? And so, you know, they kill their kids and their wife and then blow their own head off over and over and over. I mean, really, there's like an epidemic of this kind of thing. And, um, and it's all because, you know, basically they're getting screwed by the central bank and the effects of those policies. I mean, and that's just one part of it, of course. There's the cost of the empire and the cost of the rest of the national government and whatever. But uh, what's happened basically is there are massive unseen forces screwing these people. And so they're upset, they're insecure, whatever good job they had is gone. And then so, of course, you know, it's so much easier to blame trade with China or, you know, Mexican immigration or something like yeah. that than to actually go and read Rothbard and understand Dude. why there is a fake prosperity followed by a very real boom, how this happens, why it happens why it's good for the state and its cronies, but bad for everybody else. And, and you know, I don't know. It's a, but, you know, the, did you ever read that book? Um, I'm sorry, you have to Google it. Uh, but the title of the book is War is the Force that Gives... Uh, War is the... Yeah, the Hedges. War is the Force that Gives us Meaning. Right. Mm -hmm. Did you read that book? Yeah, yeah, it's a great one. It really is. And I am no fan of Chris Hedges, but that book is... Yeah, sad. I think it's... A, I read that book. It's really awesome. But, yeah. you, you know, you can... But in a sense, it's too narrowly drawn in a, in a sense because, I mean, what I'm sensing right now is all these calls for, you know, bringing back American greatness and that sort of stuff. It's like, given that people are feeling so crappy about their own lives, and which, which I'm not even sure if that's based on illusion or not. I mean, you know, we have better technology we've ever had. I mean, in some sense, the standard of living is higher than it's ever been. The problem is our discretionary income is on the decline and the family structures are collapsing because of the requirement of two, two incomes. I mean, so it's, it's a complicated picture. But, um, but, you know, you wonder if maybe people are sort of like, like, like you know, asking the state uh, to give us meaning. You know, like, I can't find meaning in my own life. You know, is there anything that, that the, the state or the nation, you know, as a kind of an organic, breathing, living, meaningful thing in the world can, can, can give me personally some sense of belongingness that, that I don't currently feel under the, under the uh, 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 current economic situation. I mean, that's what I sense from, from, the, Trump, uh, from the Trump situation and to some extent from the, from the Sanders situation too. I mean, yeah, so well, not, of course, that's the, that's the whole Straussian thing, right? National greatness. We need a big project and the Hoover Dam or you know, a, a new highway system or something like that. It's just not enough. We need yeah. war. We need something I mean, the, for people the, the, to the, rally the, around, tell them whatever lie we need to, to get them right. to join but, up I mean, to the, fight but the bad war, guys. War is the second step. On, uh, that's one thing. But it's just also sort of like building the state. I mean, you look at somebody like, um, like, like, like Russia under Stalin, right? So, so Stalin realized that communism was a disaster. Everything was sort of, sort of falling apart. You know, it was the, the whole project of the Bolshevik Revolution and Marxist-Leninism was, was ridiculous. So he reconstituted the whole ideology as a kind of a, um, a, a, instead of an international socialism, suddenly it was all about the great mother Russia. He wed patriotism and, and nativism to Marxist-Leninist ideology and sort of rescued it from itself by distracting people, saying, yeah, you know, your lives, you might feel crappy about your standard of living, but look, you're part of some grander project. You know, yeah. that, that's that. a perfect analogy, right? We don't, never mind freedom. We don't, we already gave up on that. So we'll just, you know, give us something, you know, give us a shovel and a hole to dig and we'll go do that and be <laughs> part of something great. Like, like Rachel Maddow's commercials on MSNBC, you know? Oh God, those are horrible. Look at the Hoover Dam. We can, we can build more big dams, everyone. Come on. Yeah, and and the New Deal was the same thing. I mean, look at the way it, it progressed. I mean, so things are hip during the twenties. Everything's great. Then everything falls apart. People lose faith in the economy, and then this this jerk comes along with his proto-fascist, you know, sort of policies, FDR. And then it's like rally around the great policies. It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if they, they don't work. They don't make sense. They're ridiculously expensive. They're spending money we don't have, and so on. It was like, you know, let's let's do something together, you know, as a nation. And that lasted. Um, for you know six or seven years and then it was like well geez people are kind of getting annoyed at this too hey here's a great idea let's have a gigantic global war where we draft everybody we slaughter them they're no longer on the unemployment rolls 
and and we reward ourselves for for making the world you know free of of tyranny or whatever the hell it is you know it's like these things sort of sort of move from one iteration to the next and it's a little scary actually when you think about it like are are we entering into a repeat of this of the same history you know yeah absolutely well that's the whole thing that's why we're doing this show right now is to try to explain that actually this kind of things happened before and not just Mises, but all kinds of, you know, people who understand capitalism have said before, no, freedom didn't cause the problem. And no, socialism and or fascism, uh, left or right, however you choose it, is not yeah. the answer. It's freedom is what works. And it's abandoning freedom is what got us into this mess. And so deregulate completely decentralized completely start repealing laws and don't stop ever that's the solution not great leadership for god's sake and you know i don't know man i think a lot of americans i mean i think of people i know they're smarter than to believe in some great man coming promising them a bunch of crap so i don't know who these people are who love it so much you know yeah, i know what bernie you mean. sanders I'm, I'm like I, I can see people loving having an alternative to Hillary or love having an alternative to Jeb. Give me somebody other than these people that, you know, the establishment wants to foist on us. I certainly sympathize with that, but it's the same stupid reason why people become left and rightists in the first place is to be at least not that other side that they're more against. And so, you know, well, it's a big pain in the neck to me. I mean, I, it's like, yeah. <laughs> I, I gotta tell you, I mean, I've been very uh, sort of bitter about this because you know, as I look at the trajectory we're moving on, I mean, uh, so many, uh, in so many ways, the 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 structures of the of the old style government are being challenged as never before through P2P technology, whether it's Bitcoin or 3D printing or or global online sharing and the, the app economy, and you see the practical effects on on these micro monopolies like the taxi cabs in, in New York or or uh, you know the way Airbnb is you know dismantling. Um, uh, the zoning laws, and and you see a, 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 th people through their cons consuming habits together mm. with the entrepreneurs are kind of like gradually breaking down these old structures. You can you can see it, you can feel it, and if we have enough time, I think we can actually get where we want to go. I mean, I think it's actually possible. And then in the midst of all of this, Scott, in the midst of all this, we have to have. A, an election like <laughs> like why are we doing this you know and and what are we going to get out of this we're going to get another person with a mandate and a vision and you know and 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 some big desire to be part of the history book you know by doing some great thing which is going to be impossibly statist and horrible and there's no chance whatsoever that whoever is elected is going to do anything good i don't i don't believe um, I mean, why? I mean, like every, every speech, Trump says, "Why don't we hold the election today so I can be, become president now? Why don't we just do that?" And everybody goes, "Yeah." Well, my proposal is exactly the opposite. Let's just cancel this damn thing. Let's just not hold it at all, and just kind of keep making the, the what seems to me the very gradual, bit by bit, progress that that we're making. This, I mean, has it always been this way? I mean, has politics? always been this horrible like like a, like a guarantee uh you know uh it's going to give us something worse than what we have or what we would otherwise have and has that always been true i'm not entirely sure but it certainly seems true true to me this time like no good can come with this nothing yeah no nah, i can't really disagree it does just keep getting worse and worse and of course you know they just trade off you have apparently i don't know roughly 150 million people lean a little bit left and lean a little bit right and so they just trade off being angry not that's it's funny because the famous carol quigley quote from tragedy and hope where he says yeah. you know all all we do we have an election every four every eight or even four years if necessary so that the people can throw the rascals out without ever leading to a real substantial shift in policy. And we all know what the policy should be, and that is maintain the Atlantic Alliance and keep printing money and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like that, that's his shtick. And what's funny is it's in reaction to the rise of the new right that almost got Barry Goldwater elected and a nuclear war started, right? And so Quigley is saying, 
you know, holy crap, the actual outlier won the primary and the nomination. That never happens. It's always the Rockefeller guy on the left and the Rockefeller guy on the right that are the that are the nominees. That you know, the centrists, the the liberal uh, Republican versus the conservative Democrat, right? Jeb versus Hillary. But so, oh no, in 64, this was the crazy aberration where Goldwater actually got the nomination. And how dangerous and scary was that where the establishment people here, and Quigley wouldn't agree, but the establishment guys here are the worst, right? They're the absolute worst people you can imagine. But the alternatives to them are even worser. <laughs> I mean, look at who we're talking about here. Bernie Sanders, who would have us all completely bankrupt and out on our ass. Yeah, we'd, we'd be like having to become cannibals of our own children. I mean, there'd be mass famine if this guy gets in charge, you know? Yeah. And versus Donald Trump, who's just, you know what? I'll create my own private army. I don't care about you. And just raise up the brown shirts to go and challenge the, <laughs> the old national security state. I'll make my own. I got a billion dollars. <laughs> I got a trillion dollars. Try and stop me. Yeah, I mean, it's the absence of principle, uh, you know, in, in American public life today is shocking. And, and, um, uh, and, and the absence of the word human liberty, you know, it's very frustrating. Now you watch these Republican debates and nobody actually talks about, like, human liberty. I mean, no one talks about freedom at all. They don't even pretend. They totally forgot to even pretend that they care about freedom. This is the exact same thing in the 90s, I remember. All the right-wingers mm -hmm. pretended they hated government. Oh, we hate government. Those jackbooted thugs. Boo-hoo-hoo. We hate them so much. And then by the time of Lewinsky in 98 and by the time of Republican regime change, you know what? That Bill Clinton, he's a disgrace to the great office of the great presidency of the great government of the United States of America. <laughs> now, now Bush and Cheney and the real adults are going to come in and be great leaders. Let us all kneel and worship them. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then these guys come back and call themselves the Tea Party. We're for fiscal responsibility. Yeah, sure you are. You're for world revolution the day before yesterday. Now you're for fiscal responsibility. Please, just give them their next McCain. Give them their next, oh, and Trump. Well, yeah, I'll never, I'll never trust to these Tea Party. You know, I, I, I guess I was brief. Was I? I, mean, I, was, I feel like maybe I was briefly tempted to think that this Tea Party movement, uh, could amount to something. I'm not entirely sure about that, but maybe I, I wasn't as alarmed by them as I should have been. But now you see what's happened, right? I mean, this this whole kind of revolt, you know, that we saw, you know, over the last ten years, is is all just completely funneled into you know like fanatical Trump worship. You know, I mean, it's 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 just it's just just an awesome thing. You're blindly following this would-be dictator around, you know, where, you know, he's proclaiming, you know, oh, let's deport everybody. Let's execute Edward Snowden. You know, let's, let's, uh, let's wage war on, on trade war on, on the world. And, let's reinvade yeah. Iraq and occupy all their oil fields and starve the people there out until yeah. they don't exist anymore. Or, 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 yeah, let's, 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 uh, my favorite, I've mentioned this to you before, Scott, but I just can't forget it. L let's make nuclear weapons mean something again. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like, what? what? what the fission or fusion or both or what? Yeah. So and people are concerned. Oh, and let's have single payer, payer health care. Let's have single payer. Jonah Goldberg. Dude, you know what? Hey, hey, hey! I thought of you uh, yesterday. I read a thing. Oh, you know what? It was Jonah Goldberg though, so it might not be true no, at no, all. I was, was, was going to mention it about Jonah Goldberg. It said, he says in there that when Trump voters are told that he endorses single payer health care, their support for single payer health care goes up from 25% to 44%. <laughs> That's conservatism in America for you right there. <laughs> right there. Although then again, that was written by Jonah Goldberg. So it might be an outright lie. I mean, I think people should no, really double check no, that statistic before I mean, taking my word for it. Because no, John mean, Goldberg is the lowest scum on the planet Earth, so there's that. But, He's but, worse you, than Donald Trump, you got to admit. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, he always has struck me as slightly more libertarian than some of the other people that, that are there. But I, I just don't know. I don't read him enough. But no, no, I did, You should read Baghdad Delenda Est, part one and two by him. And would he come out later that. against the... I mean, I know these guys are inconsistent, you know, and uh, but... Uh, no, I don't think Mad so. Against the war, I, I, I might be wrong, but I. I don't know. But anyway, on the, on the healthcare thing, he says, "Guys, don't you know? I mean, for ten years, this has been the thing that's united us as conservatives. 
is oppositions of single payer healthcare. You know, how can you be? How can you be doing this? Well, so the problem. The, here's the problem. You can't really unite people based on some bogus little policy issue like that. Some wonky thing. You know, look, I'm against single party healthcare, but that's not a principled stand. <clears throat> that's not a philosophy. That's not a, a rooted you know, perspective on seeing the world just to be ag against some, some, some left-wing wonk, wonky thing. I mean, yeah, of course people are going to throw that away when they get in enticed by some, you know, uh, di you know would-be dictator billionaire. Uh, and, and yeah, so they just throw it all away because, because why? Because, because there's been no schooling or knowledge or understanding of, of the idea of human liberty, which I gather is too abstract an idea for the, for the bourgeoisie or for the, or for the journalists of National Review to even comprehend nowadays. Yep. Hey, man, tell me about Joseph Schumpeter. I know I'm saying that wrong, but I'm from Texas. What do I know? Yeah, yeah, you yeah. You were telling so, me about, you read this great book that he wrote about imperialism. Look, it's kind of, it was written a century ago, and it was called uh, Sociology of Imperialisms. And he marches through all these different kinds of empires, from, from, from Rome to the Arab Empire to the British Empire, um, Spain. Uh, you know, I guess I wrote about this two weeks ago. But, and he distinguishes... Oh, yeah, but yeah, somewhere. But he distinguishes uh, the, the, they all have sort of different characteristics. Uh, some of them are more cruel, and some of them are more are more smart. Like the cruel ones just go in and kill everybody, rape all the women, pillage all the property. The intelligent ones go in and uh, just insist on sort of loyalty at the top, but otherwise sort of reemploy all the people who are sort of the professional bureaucrats and preserve all the value of the property and, and that sort of thing. So imperialisms take uh, many different forms. Some of them very stupid, some of them cruel, some murderous, some of them uh, you know, so, somewhat humanitarian at some level, uh, just kind of a uh, nice colonialism or something like that. Uh, and, and, and as I was reading, this is 1912, so this is before the, we really saw the fullness of the American empire. And I kept trying to understand Oh, the other thing is that he says the motivations for each empire is different. Um, some of them are designed, uh, are, are constructed out of a sort of a messianic desire to conquer the world. Others are designed to, uh, <clears throat> to retain a domestic political control and whip up the, the public against some you know, weird foreign enemy. Mm -hmm. um, so each each one of them has a, some of them are just purely resource based. You know, let's go out and and pillage other people's stuff. You know, so every every empire has a different sort of rationale and a different uh, method for going about its business. And this was, as I say, it was written in 1912, and I found the book so incredibly insightful. I mean, just from a historical point of view. And God, I don't know whatever. Why don't we have scholars like this anymore? I don't. I don't really know. I mean, it was so erudite and so knowledgeable. But I kept, as I was reading, kept trying to understand what is the nature and character of the of the American empire. And it seems like it sort of combines the worst traits of all empires in all of human history. In a way, <laughs> you know, it's like the worst motivations, the worst tactics, uh, and also, you know, combined with a healthy dose of, of rampant stupidity, um, you know, it was just sort of sort of overwhelmed me. Like I would have, lo I would love him for him to be around now to update this book on a final chapter on the nature of the U.S. empire. You know? Yeah. Well, you know, in fact, back to that same passage of Carol Quigley again. That's what he's complaining about: is the rise of the new right, the military-industrial complex after World War II. That after a war effort that big, there's no dismantling the thing. They got a hold of Harry Truman real quick, and they said, we're going to find something to do. It was do. fairly quick, but there, there was kind of a substantial demilitarization that happened after World War II, and a decontrol, substantial, of course, it didn't go back to where it was before World War II. But yeah, then the, 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 the Cold War came along and uh, uh, changed everything. The more I think about it, uh, the Cold War was the thing that really ruined life on Earth, in a way. You know, it corrupted the right. Um, it, uh, it, it made it impossible for the U.S. to go back to an, 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 a sort of a normalcy. Um, and, you know, I grew up in the Cold War, so I, my whole impression was that we, were only ha we only had a military empire to get rid of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union went away. We still have the empire, you know? And I gather, I mean, you keep up with this better than I do. Weren't you telling me that the we're, we're, U.S. is currently in, engaged <clears throat> in a bunch of wars around the world and you wanted to kind of march through them a little bit? 
Yeah, that's part of the plan for the show later on, whenever we're done talking about this stuff, is to get through, you know, a picture of America's intervention as it stands right now. Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to know about it just because um I mean there's still a, a you know, the a typical um member of the bourgeoisie in this country is pretty much unaware. It was actually my old friend Joe Stromberg who used to point this out to me. Mm. Um, most Americans have no clue that the U.S. is really doing anything to anybody anywhere in the world. I mean, they think America is really just backyard barbecues uh, and baseball and pop music. You know, that's what that's what their conception of, of America is. Around the world, though, it's you know something completely different. And that's why after two thousand, after nine eleven. Uh, Americans got the entirely wrong message from this. You know, they didn't think, "Oh my God!" You know, this is the the consequences of empire. They thought, "Huh, here's some crazy ragheads that hate us for no particular reason," just because they, you know, had no idea of what what the U.S. is even doing abroad. Yeah, and you know, what's sad about that is that's kind of what's beautiful about living all the way over here in North America and having as a creed that we believe in individual liberty and never mind everything else, kind of a thing that you know the old world they're always going to be fighting over those borders and how well they match up with different ethnicities and these kinds of things and we should be you know we mostly are free of that kind of thing over here we mostly are free to mind our own business you know i'm from texas i've known plenty of people who never left their home county that's right you know, their whole life long and why leave everything that is there their family all their work all their their church and their everything is right there and that's why their great grandparents fled whatever hellhole to come here in the first place. So they could mind their own business, but they're doing such a good job minding their own business that they have no idea that their government is not minding its own business. No, they have no it's clue. Not, you know, yeah. So they, as you say, they have no idea. So busy living their life, they just kind of assume that that's way the and, way and America know, operates. It's a beautiful thing. You know where I just was? I was just in Wyoming, and uh, I don't know if you, how much you know about Wyoming, but there's nobody there. Oh, it's beautiful, man. Yeah, I mean, I love, this is yeah, been, empty, apparently it's owned 97% by the federal government. Every, every bit of amount of uh, property that you, you try to develop, you know, is, is sort of leased um, from the fed, fed, feds, which is just an outrage in a way. But, you know, yeah. it's, it's so funny to be there because there's a number of things that strike you. One is you can't believe this place is actually, in a way, I was actually impressed. I was standing on top of a mountaintop looking out of what you know, looked like 300 miles of you know, gorgeous mountains and everything else. And I thought, you know, this is a very successful empire from D.C. that it ever could have gained control in any sense of this place. So far away, so uh, sparsely populated, you know. I mean, it's, 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 in a sense, the U.S. is one of the most successful empires in the history of the world that it could have gained control of such vast amounts of territory. And yet every little coffee shop downstairs was obeying every tiny regulation, you know, that it comes out of the Federal, Reserve, Federal, Federal Register. You know, it's, it's, an, it's an awesome thing that something like that exists. So I couldn't believe that you, the U.S., you know, Washington, D.C. purports to manage this place at all. That's kind of awesome. But meanwhile, I'm there in the midst of this, this immigration hysteria. Oh, my God, people are pouring into this country. Well, you know, I mean, I mean most of this country is completely empty, you know, and, and, and unpopulated, actually. I mean, I don't know how much people understand this, but you only have to go to a place like Wyoming and suddenly realize this. I mean, it's... it's it's, yeah, just go up in an airplane and look out the window. <laughs> there's nothing here. I mean, everyone should probably see the town. But I mean, it's just, the frontier's closed, but we're not done filling in the spaces. That's all. Not, you can fit the whole world's population in a place like Wyoming, and nobody would ever have to, you know, you'd still be able to live a mile apart from each other or something. I don't know. What, it's well, just, of course, the empire's so big now that that's why they had to coin the phrase homeland. Well, first of all, is to break you of whatever associations you made with USA you know, the country where you thought you were from, where you were free. But then, but secondly, you know, Washington, D.C., they're really busy and they got to separate these things so they can keep track of them. And there's the world empire where they, you know, deem to control all of the entire world, uh, including, you know, as Carl Gershman wrote in the Washington Post, Vladimir Putin, if he doesn't like it, he might find himself regime change too. Uh, you know, is their attitude. Oh, and then, of course, you know, we still got to rule everybody, you know, between Bangor, Maine and San Diego, California, too. And so that's, you know, their separate priority, mostly to suck off of us so that they can pay for the foreign empire. 
It, it but, strikes me as just so implausible and completely unsustainable, especially in modern times, you know? I mean, the, the whole American empire just seems so, like, absurdly 19th century. I just, I, I, I just, and by empire, I mean not international, but, you know, so-called domestic. Although, it shouldn't call it domestic. I mean, this, the United States should be, should be, you know, several hundred countries at least, it seems to me, you know? We could start with 50. <laughs> And then, you know, I'm all for further secession than that. We could break Texas into five overnight. That'd be all right. <laughs> yeah. uh, by the way, just uh, in passing, Scott, I want you to know that I fell off a horse. Are you all right? Yeah. All right. <laughs> I freaking rode, I rode a horse. I mean, I galloped, I galloped on a horse. Great. And galloped on a, and, and, you know, I didn't center my gravity right. You know, you're supposed to, like, ride forward. That's sort of sitting up. Fell off on the ground. Oh man! Oh, I'm glad you're okay. Well, yeah, I'm not. Um, but uh, I, I thought can, you said you were okay. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm alive or whatever. I sprained my wrist. Yeah, it was still hurting, but you know, bruises all over me. But it was funny in Wyoming. You know, you, you stand up, you stand up from a, a situation like that. You're surrounded by cowboys, and uh, you try to get some sympathy. They're like, uh, no, "What are you goodness. doing? Get, you know, get back on your horse, buddy. You know." Shape up. <laughs> it's pretty Man, funny. I want to go horseback ride. I haven't ridden a horse in 20 years or 25. Why do we like, why do we like horses? That was a little kid. What is it so appealing about, about getting on a horse and using they're, it? They're that? like big, nice dogs, and you can ride on them. <laughs> and the horse was so fast if you get a fast one. Oh, this one was, I think I was going, going 40 miles an hour when I flew off this thing and hit the ground. I mean, it was, it was I know it seems, the whole thing seems implausible to you, but uh, yeah, it was, quite, it was quite the awesome experience. The, 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 and, you know, the, the cowboys of Wyoming, you know, they're just the salt of the earth. They tell me the best stories about environmentalism. You know, they laugh about the left-wing environmentalists trying to protect this and protect that, you know. You know, th th these people really understand and know the la land. They respect and love nature. Um, but they also understand that, that there's enemies out there, you know, uh, grizzly bears, wolves, you know. <laughs> they... And 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 one cowboy saying, I don't know what it is with with uh, all the liberals in this country. By liberals, you know who he means. He says uh, they seem to be only they're only interested in the predators. You know, they they only want to protect the the worst, the worst animals against the best. You know, um, and uh, they're always pushing you know crazy schemes to you know, stop development and stop us from doing what we have to do to survive around here. You know, it was it was a really fascinating sort of. Uh, opportunity to sort of touch real people and real real frontiers. I mean, real frontiers people, you know, and they still exist in this country. It's just, it's just awesome. Just freedom loving, salt of the earth, you know, cowboys and cowgirls. Yeah. All right. Well, if I ever take a vacation, I'm going back to Wyoming because it is really nice. Now, there. have you been? So you have been? Oh yeah, I've been there when I was a kid. Yellowstone and all that kind of. Thing. Well, it was kind of like yeah. I mean, the reason I was there was that uh, this is a traditional place now for the Federal Reserve to hold its annual uh, conference of central bankers from around the world. They all go to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and live it up. Um, this has been going on for 40 years, 35, 40 years, something like that. And mm -hmm. this year, for the first time, they had uh, opposition conferences, uh, one from the left, where these people just think that, you know, the goal of monetary policy is to print as much uh, as possible and, and make the world, you know, instantly rich through some sort of magical means or whatever it is these people think. And when I got to the airport, they were there, the Federal Reserve was there, and, they were there. and, we, and my group was, was the sound money gold standard opposition, you know. And, uh, and I, I didn't speak about the gold standard since I don't have that much interest in that subject anymore, even though it has been a lifetime passion. But ever since cryptocurrency was invented, that's been my passion. So I was on a panel with, with the great, uh, uh, well, I say that because you, you, know, I'm, you may, not, may not agree, but at least on technology, it's great, great George Gilder. So I'm sitting on a panel with George Gilder to speak about, uh, about uh, cryptocurrency. And it was wonderful. But so now the Fed is being challenged from the, I guess you could say the left and the right. I mean, I don't like to think of myself right, but I mean, that's the way the world treats it. And it was, it was fabulous. So we had three simultaneous conferences and uh, three separate visions of what money is. And I think, I think it's great. I mean, we're, and the New York Times wrote a big article about it. You know, so I was, I was pleased to be there. I mean, that's the way you make a difference, I think. Yeah, I saw a thing. A uh, guy sent me a link to 
Peter Schiff talking about a Black Lives Matter group that was out there protesting, I yeah. guess the group from the left that you're talking about. Yeah. And then, so I went and Googled that and I found where uh, there was a Huffington Post article about how it was some liberal college professors, economics professors who said, you know, we need to organize a group of people to demand lower and lower interest rates and easier and easier monetary policy because otherwise you're being mean to the poor. That's it. So that was where I, they came from. I loved hanging out with Peter. He and I had uh, you know a dinner a couple of nights, and you know, it's, it's, he's just he's just just endlessly fun and endlessly interesting, and, and a grave Bitcoin skeptic, by the way. You know, he doesn't doesn't believe any of this stuff, so he treats me like a, like I'm a, I'm a deluded digital fanatic or something, which maybe I am, but but I enjoyed seeing him and just enjoyed being a, in the, in the presence of of you know what struck struck me anyway as a, a great intellectual firmament, you know. Yeah. All right. Well, so you want to talk about the wars or what? Let's do it. You want to talk about all these ghastly wars that are that the Federal Reserve is funding right now? Yeah, let's do it. So, um, well, first of all, Tom in the chat room has a great opportunity that if America had just been the you know played the bigger man and done you know like Ron Paul said or Harry Brown said at the time, do an extremely limited operation just to hunt down Bin Laden, Zawahiri, and their you know maybe a couple of dozen closest friends, put them on trial, shut the whole thing down, and then go ahead and end the empire anyway. What are we doing bases in Saudi Arabia anyway? What are we doing intervening in, in Israel-Palestine anyway? And uh, we could have done a lot, had the whole world on our side and completely blew it. And That's right. Uh, and, you yeah. know, that's kind of the theme for my whole little rant here is how America, you know, and I'm tongue-in-cheek here, obviously, but... There are so many people who think Al Qaeda just works for the CIA and that kind of deal. But I think you could spin it just as easy the other way around, where, you know, really Bush and Cheney, and for that matter, Obama and Biden and Hillary and them all really work for Al Qaeda and have all along because they've done nothing but accomplish bin Laden's goals this entire time. And so, what it was that bin Laden was trying to do, as was well explained before 9 11 ever happened, and of course, they attacked us in the First World Trade Center and in 1993 and the Kobar Towers attack in Saudi Arabia, the African embassies and the coal and, and then September 11th. And they're trying to draw us in. And uh, James, as James Bamford puts it, they saw Bin Laden in the role of Ho Chi Minh and they're trying to drag us into another Vietnam. Just like had been America's policy to drag Russia into their own Vietnam uh, in, Viet in uh, Afghanistan in the 1980s. They wanted to replicate that against the United States of America. And so that's why the terrorist attack is, it's a provocation to try to get you to overreact. The goal being to get America, again, to, to bo get bogged down, bankrupt itself, and then withdraw in humiliating defeat like the Soviet Union did, and then leave them alone. Stop, get out of the region entirely uh, because they figured none of their local revolutions could ever you know, succeed or take hold as long as America is backing their local dictatorships. So the goal was to get us to intervene over there, bog us down, bankrupt our treasury, radicalize the region and turn them against their American loyal sock puppet dictators, and then eventually declare their caliphate, which at the time, even at the time of bin Laden's death in the spring of 2001, was still just his attic where he was hiding from his wife, even up in, uh, you know, Nowheresville in Pakistan. There was no caliphate. There was nothing. Um, but anyway, I'm skipping ahead there. It's only, you know, very recently that it's gone that far. But what America's done really is accomplish all of their goals. Although Bush, really because he was forced to, uh, really short-circuited their plan by leaving Iraq early, by signing a deal to leave Iraq uh, in great numbers early. They wanted us to stay for years and years and lose thousands and thousands more guys and trillions and trillions more dollars before we left. But anyway, um, they did completely radicalize the region. If you look at the Arab Spring, well, first of all, the Iraq War, America, by invading and then staying and taking a side in building a so-called democracy there, majority rules, that means siding with the Shia Arabs and the Kurds against the Sunni Arabs and kicking them all out of Baghdad and straight in the arms of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which helped them fight their, which never existed before the invasion in Iraqi Sunni stand. But uh, 
rose up after the invasion and uh and of course grew into the islamic state that we're dealing with today uh but then that's what really set off the sectarian sunni shia civil war that had not been going on but now is raging across the region and if you look at the arab spring in 2011 with the revolution in tunisia and egypt and then in what began in libya in yemen in bahrain and syria this was all because of the destabilization of the region by america's invasion of iraq all the refugees the debasing of our currency which all their governments had to match in order to prevent you know disruptions in the trade balances and so forth but ended up leading to inflation that rode into the very poor you know when you only live on a dollar a day and now your dollar's worth 50 cents that's the difference between make it or break it for your kids being alive, you know, kind of thing. So those were the bread riots and the destabilization that led to the revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt. Then America and Saudi and their henchmen hijacked the Arab Spring in Libya and in Syria and in Yemen. They crushed it in Bahrain and got away with it there uh, with uh, Saudi force. They did a regime change. Well, they supported a military coup in Egypt, which, which canceled the democratic revolution there. Um, they got rid of one sock puppet and installed another in Yemen. And, but worst of all, what Obama did in reaction to the Arab Spring was in working with Saudi, Turkey, Israel, and Qatar to support the revolution against Assad in Syria. And now the majority, 70-something percent of Syrians are Sunni Arabs. However, most of them actually support the government. Not that they support Assad the dictator, because I don't think anybody really likes him. But they support the army and they support the state for the same reason that Americans supported George W. Bush. He's fighting al-Qaeda for us. And so that was basically the deal, is America and Saudi acting the jihadists, the bad guys from Iraq War II, have become the moderate rebels in the war in Syria. And they're working to uh, overthrow Assad there, which is what's leading to this massive uh, refugee crisis right now. And so here you have America fought and is still fighting for Iran and their interests in Shiistan in southeastern Iraq. They're still backing the Kurds in northern Iraq. They're fighting both against the Islamic State in Western Iraq and in Eastern Syria, where America is backing not the Islamic State, but is backing the guys who are exactly like them in al-Nusra and Arar al-Sham, the other jihadist groups. There are no moderates. Those are just a myth. They're all a bunch of head-chopping bin Ladenite suicide bomber crazies, including the so-called Free Syrian Army. And... America is actually on the side of the bin Ladenites, uh, along with our allies, against Iran's ally, Assad, in Syria. And only because that's what our allies want, as basically a sop to them. And then on top of that, where America has had a drone war going on in Yemen for, you know, really since Obama came into power in 2009, Bush had done a couple, but Obama's been steadily bombing them since 2009. Uh, right now, we're actually backing the Saudis' war for Al-Qaeda. At the same time, we're still drone bombing them as recently as last week. We're fighting with the Saudis for Al-Qaeda against their enemies, the so-called Iranian-backed Shiite Houthi movement, which has taken over Sana in response to, uh, in, in basically as reaction to America overthrowing their last puppet and installing the next one. And, uh, and they drove him out of power. Iran actually, and even Obama himself admitted, Iran warned the Houthis not to take the capital city because it would be biting off more than they could chew and cause bad reaction from the Saudis. They did it anyway. But anyway, as long as they're blaming it on Iran, you literally have America fighting for and against Al-Qaeda in Yemen at the same damn time. I mean, fighting for Iran in Iraq and for Al-Qaeda against Iran in Syria, that's one thing. But fighting for and against both sides in Yemen at the same damn time? And meanwhile, we still got 10,000 guys in Afghanistan and we still got a drone war going on in Pakistan uh, where they're just, you know, killing people in recent weeks. Anyone can check news.antiwar.com. Jason Ditz keeps, keeps us all up to date on all the latest of the, the drone wars. And then, of course... The Libya war spread down into Mali, 
and the jihadists from Libya met the jihadists from Nigeria in Mali and traded, uh, you know, uh, radical ideology and weapons and training and made Boko Haram in Nigeria even worse than they ever were. And now a declared adjunct of the Islamic State, which is the same thing you have uh, in Libya. And you still have the drone war in Somalia, which is what took an Islamic courts movement that was led by a bunch of old men, a bunch of moderate old men that America could have dealt with. And we sponsored Ethiopia and other countries to invade and occupy the place, overthrow that government. And in response has risen up the Al-Shabaab movement, which is just basically Al-Qaeda in Somalia, which just attacked and killed a bunch of people in the capital city, uh, I think two days ago. So there's your news hostility scoreboard. America still at war, still killing people on all sides of all battles in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, Libya, Mali, Nigeria, Syria, and Iraq. Oh, and uh, also in February 2014, they supported a coup d'etat by a bunch of Nazis in Ukraine who then uh, they went to war against the people in the East who refused to accept the coup government. And Obama sent the military there, and they are now, our rangers are over there training the Azov Battalion and the right sector, Hitler-loving, Jew-hating Nazis with literal swastikas and SS lightning bolts and 88 and 14s. You know, Trump voters, only the very right edge of the Ukrainian Trump voters, for real, over there. Uh, and we're st and, and, and working on a war, literally working on getting us into a war with Russia over a country that is as important to them as any province in Russia. You know, maybe they didn't want to fight a nuclear war over Germany. They were all the way extended that far west from their own border at that point anyway. The line was drawn halfway across Germany, but they will fight for Ukraine. And America is trying to make a fight out of that. And it's the very same neocons, the very same couple of dozen relatives of Gertrude Himmelfarb and Irving Crystal and Norman Podhoritz and their sons and their cousins who have done this, all of them, on each and every one of these goddamn wars, including the Afghan surge, which was Fred Kagan. Well, this is why we pay you the big bucks, Scott. Uh, you know, that was an awesome uh, roundup. Awesome. But the, you know, the thing that struck, struck me and, and, and actually sort of blows my mind is your trajectory that you drew between U.S. intervention and in, in Iraq, you know, initially 25 years ago, I guess, and the current refugee crisis in, in, in Europe. Uh, I, I wonder if you could explain that a little bit more, because I, I don't know how much people are aware of the news about this refugee crisis. Can you explain to me what's going on and, and its, its meaning and implications for Europe? Yeah, well, if you want to go back to 91, very quickly, Bush, basically his secretary of state baited, I don't know deliberately, Jeff, the way it played out, I don't think so. It was stumbling a bit, but they basically told Saddam, go ahead and invade Kuwait. We don't care. Just take the northern oil fields and don't take the whole country. But he took the whole country. And then Margaret Thatcher said, oh, no, we can't have that. Don't get wobbly. And so they had Operation Desert Storm. And once they started the buildup, they wouldn't take peace for an answer. Saddam tried to negotiate. They wouldn't do it. And they, America occupied the Saudi desert in order to launch the war against Iraq. And then when the war was over, they stayed because they had encouraged the Shia to rise up and overthrow Saddam. And then they left him high and dry as Saddam slaughtered him with their, his attack helicopters that they let him keep. And so... Um, and then they said, well, now we have to have a no-fly zone over Iraq, so we have to stay in Saudi Arabia and, uh, and keep the sanctions on. We'll never lift the sanctions and we'll never lift the no-fly zones over Iraq, became the policy. And that was what brought on the Al-Qaeda war against the United States. Uh, that and, of course, support for Israel and their perpetual uh, wars against the people of Lebanon and Palestine. And so... Uh, those were the policies that led up to the 9-11 attack, which then, as you say, we're supposed to just think, what? Well, we didn't do a thing in the 1990s except sit around and watch Seinfeld and, and watch The Simpsons, and that was all that happened or whatever, but in fact, it wasn't. And um, But so they pretended history began yesterday. They attacked us for no good reason, so now we have to go defend ourselves. So And then that became cover for invading Iraq, even though Saddam Hussein was enemies with Osama bin Laden. They had no ties whatsoever. 
They just said, hey, are you upset and you still want to kill some people? Well, come on. And they kind of said, well, we have to do Iraq because of September 11th. Because that day we learned that from now on we have to start all the wars instead of waiting around for someone to attack us. But what you thought that they were saying was because Saddam did 9-11. Isn't that what it sounded like he said? And so that's how they basically, you know, BS the American people into there. And it was because, again, these neoconservatives who are Likudniks first, uh, meaning the right-wing nationalist party in Israel of Ariel Sharon and Benjamin Netanyahu, and they wanted to smash the Middle East into smaller and smaller uh, tribal and warring states. As David Wumser wrote in Coping with Crumbling States about Syria, we want to expedite the chaotic collapse. And the sooner the better to make it, you know, to turn things our way. And so that's exactly what they got. They fought an uh, eight-year war in Iraq, uh, really five of it, a full-scale civil war for the Shia against the Sunnis and dividing that country permanently into thirds the way they did. And they created four and a half million refugees, internal and external, during that war. About half of them went to Jordan and Syria. Probably of those, probably much more than half went to Syria and some to Jordan. And then once the war in Syria broke out, they had no place else to go except, I guess, some of them went back to Iraq. Others went to Turkey. And then many more have joined them in in uh, Turkey, America has been waging war again with our allies for four years straight, supporting the Sunni insurgency, the, the bin Ladenites in this war in Syria. And now they're worried. Uh, you know, Patrick Coburn is reporting that they're threatening the last major highway lifeline between the capital city and whichever other uh, Aleppo or another couple of major cities there. And so people are running scared. You know, the dead. Uh, toddler on the beach uh, that is is all in the in the yeah. media right now. They're trying to say, well, so we have to attack Syria. Enough is enough. We have to attack Assad in Damascus. But that baby boy was a Kurd who fled the town of Kobani, which America did take the Kurd side. But who were they fleeing? They were fleeing from the Islamic State, yes. and and America helped the Kurds hold on to that town. But now what? Now America's made a deal with the Turks, and the Turks don't want an independent Kurdistan there in northern Syria. Right. That threatens their uh, territorial integrity with their internal Kurdish problem that they have to deal right. with. And so they said, okay, America, we'll let you use our Inserlik air base in order to attack Islamic State targets in Syria and Iraq if you will stab the Kurds in the back and uh and abandon them to us and then the turks started bombing them and so now we're just supposed to not look into it right this is no different than you know the iraqi uh soldiers who who uh stole the incubators and left the kuwaiti babies to die on the cold floor exactly. it's no different than the yazetis trapped on the mountain or the weapons of mass destruction or the impending slaughter in benghazi or on and on and on with all these fake costas belly but all that matters is, look, a dead kid, aren't you too upset to ask me about the details of how he got that way? Good, then let's bomb something. And, and what they want to bomb, again, and I know it makes me sound like I'm the one who's crazy. When I tell you, Jeff, they want to bomb on behalf of the Bin Ladenites against the guy in the three-piece suit with the clean-shaven chin who is leading the coalition of Sunnis, Shia, Alawites, Druze, and Christians. That's the guy they want to overthrow in favor of the suicide bomber, head chopper, September 11th killers. Awesome. And the refugee crisis going on in Europe, I suppose that there's enormous political pressure to accept everybody in, which obviously is a free migrationist, I agree with. However, this, I suppose, is going to help the growing problem of the far right in, in Europe, which is basically a proto-neo-Nazi uh, based movement of, of nativists and, and racialists um, that seems to be uh, gaining all sorts of ground in, 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 in France and, and Hungary and probably in an underground sense in Germany and elsewhere, right? Yeah, and, you know, I'm not sure. Um, I think it varies from country to country whether these right-wing nationalists really are, you know, go as far as, you know, being actual Nazis or not, uh, you know, really bad or just you know, what we would call Republicans, and I'm not exactly sure what's the difference when Republicans are pretty bad to me, 
but uh, yeah, I mean, this is certain to inflame them. Well, that's and that's the thing. I mean, it it, it just sort of you, you get this blowback in every direction. It's blowback, and then more blowback against the blowback, and so on. And, and well, you know, it's interesting too that I think a lot of these refugees have been in Turkey for a long time, and it sort of looks like, and I don't know enough about this really, but it sort of looks like the Turks are kicking them all out and trying to tell them to all go to Europe. Yeah. And that may be Erdogan playing hardball with the U.S. and the EU and, and trying to get us to commit to going ahead and overthrowing Assad. Because, you know, Obama's been willing to back the Mujahideen against him, but he's not been willing to do enough to make sure that Assad loses so far anyway. And the Turks, you know, and the Saudis and the, I don't know about the Israelis, I guess they're happy with the status quo so far. Uh, but, you know, the Turks and the Saudis seem absolutely hell-bent on getting rid of Assad as soon as possible. And so this may be leveraged by him. You want some more of these refugees? I'll release another few hundred thousand. How do you like that kind of thing? Yeah. I mean, it's not something we have to deal with in the U.S. I mean, I, for the most part, I, I, I think our migration so-called crisis is entirely uh, made up. Uh, I don't see any basis for it whatsoever. I mean, it's true we have a lot of illegal immigration, but that's, that's what happens when you make, make it impossible for people to legally immigrate. They're, they're going to become illegal. I mean, it's... it's, it's it's the same thing with the drug war and and um, uh, alcohol prohibition or anything else. I mean, you prohibit immigration, legal immigration, you're going to get an explosion of illegal immigration. It's just you know, it's it's yeah. the inevitable consequence of it. But I don't well, think the entire region's at war right now. So what are civilians supposed to do except run? <coughs> yeah, I mean, there's a massive sectarian war. You know, ten years ago, I was saying things like, "Oh man, you know, the consequences of this invasion of Iraq are just going to be playing out like this for decades and decades yeah. and decades." And it's just like that. I mean, it's not going away. I mean, the fact that you know the Shiites have not ruled an Arab capital city for a thousand years, and now they do. And not like I care, but I'm just saying, so that means that there are going to be Sunnis who are willing to throw suicide bombers at that capital city of Baghdad from now unto eternity. I mean, it took the American Army and Marine Corps years to give it to the Shia. So the Sunnis aren't going to be able to take it back without major help, you know, major firepower. But they're going to keep suicide bombing it from now on. I mean, this fight is going to just, and the border between Kurdistan and the Islamic State, the border between Iraqi Shia Stan and the Islamic State, you're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles where it's just going to be like World War I trench, or I don't know, trenches, but, you know, inches and feet moving back and forth these lines for our lifetimes. This is going to just continue. Yeah, and you know, and to go back again to the beginning of your story, I mean, let's not forget that that all of this really does begin with uh, George Bush one, with yeah. Operation Desert, Desert Storm. And although you know what, Junior, I mean, and the thing is, look, I'm not for any of these nationalist dictatorships. Supporting dictatorships got us into this mess, but supporting revolutions against them is not necessarily the right thing to do either. We could just back off, you know. And what Junior could have done after September 11th was said, all right, look here, Hussein, you know I'm mad, so capitulate to all my demands, and my demands are, if there's any Bin Ladenites in your country, string them up. And Hussein would have said, all right, fine, shake on it, and then that's it. And, you know, he was the massive cork in the bottle, keeping these guys, they were stranded, there were a few dozen of them, stranded in no man's land in Afghanistan, on the Duran line between Afghanistan and Pakistan. And Bush brought them 2,000 miles west. And then Obama brought them all the way almost to the Mediterranean Sea now. So, sorry, I got off on that tangent again. They're just, they made, Junior, as bad as what Bush Sr. did and Bill Clinton with his blockade and all of that, Junior could have, you know, tried to heal it rather than just absolutely quadruple down. <clears throat> make it yeah. Anyone could have ever predicted, you know? I mean, it's it's an awesome thing to consider that you know what an opportunity we had at the end of the Cold War uh, to just become a normal country. We declined, yeah. and here we are still, 2015. You know, seeing the you know continuing rollout of these policies, which people don't look back historically. I mean, it would just be an awesome thing if, at at at, at some pundit on television, you know, at, at a Republican debate or a Democratic debate or anything, would speak realistically about this in light of a lot of history and, and current realities, to, to, to speak honestly and, and truthfully about the role uh, that empire has, 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 has caused and the sort of rollout of, of un, unending political catastrophes. This is, you know, sort of brings us back to the beginning, really. I mean, you said an interesting thing that, 
that um, as bad as dictatorship is, sometimes these revolutionaries are even worse. Uh, I feel that that's, you know, at a much lower, slower burning level is kind of more or less what we face in the U.S. You know, with, on the one hand, the establishment, and then you have the the uh, opposition, quote unquote, to the establishment, right. you know. I miss Ron. I'm sorry. I know I say that every show. We couldn't get through the show without you saying that. So I was just <laughs> waiting for that. He's so great on all this stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah. it's true enough. It's true enough. Well, I'm looking forward to uh, visiting again next week. The cool thing about the show, Scott, is yes. that, that is that that history is moving so fast that uh, forward that or, or backwards. I don't know which way, but anyway, okay. moving that we always have wonderful things to talk about. So I uh, thank you so much for your information and insight. Yeah, and everybody, you should know that uh, we're now here every other Tuesday. Oh, is, it, is that our regular strategy? time? Every other, we're not doing it weekly. We're doing it every other week? Well, we can do it weekly if you want. Well, I don't, I don't even know what our schedule is. You know, I just, oh, I wake no. up in the well, morning. We'll have to change the time if we're going to do it weekly because right now we're alternating with Sheldon and Lucy. Oh, but, okay. um, no, but I mean, it's we, fine. We, um, I don't know. I mean, it's up to you, but I just wake up in the morning and check my, my Google calendar and do what I'm told. So, you know, that's. Yeah, there you go. Right. Well, <laughs> we'll figure out what to tell your Google calendar, what to tell you to do. <laughs> Good to talk to you, Scott. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Appreciate it. Bye bye. support for, for Sanders, you know, for Trump, you know, the, the sort of screaming desire to, you know, reconstitute the uh, American greatness in some, in some way. I mean, do you think these things are, in, in some, to some extent, related? Oh, yeah, that's absolutely the core of it. You know, it. it's economic insecurity. Now, I'm not so sure about the relative economic power of America versus the European Union, uh, China, uh, India, the BRICS, and whatever, because, of course, They've got plenty and plenty of government, lots and lots of government in, in those societies too, and, and sure. major distortions in their economies as well. And so, you know, I don't know. We have huge distortions here, but we're working off uh, a very sound base of an economy here. There are a lot of factories, a lot of educated people, a lot of eh, pretty good highways here, you know what I mean, for distribution. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, I mean, the, I don't think but, it's a matter of oh no, China's rising because you know who cares about that? What they make a great scapegoat. What matters is is that people don't feel like they can take care of themselves. You know, um, I read uh, William Grider uh, it wrote the Washington Post version of the case against the Fed. I guess uh, the secrets of the temple uh, back in the nineteen no. eighties about the Volcker term. And, sure. and and he's writing pro-inflation and against Volcker for raising interest rates is basically his message. But anyway, the point is, he talks about how they keep the statistics of, uh, you know, bankruptcies and for that matter of broken marriages and suicides and foster care and all the rates of the damage done by their economic policies. And they know that it's their responsibility and they look at that. And I mean, you know me, I'm the same as you, uh, constantly online reading the news and especially in 2008 and, or, you know, end of 08 through 2009 and 10, it's just constant in the AP news wires, man kills family, then self just over and over and over and over again. Cause these guys, they thought they were doing everything right. They worked hard this whole time. And then it turned out, you know, their family can't rely on them after all they get completely depressed they they blame themselves 100 percent have no idea about the forces arrayed against them in the world you know and so you know they kill their kids and their wife and then blow their own head off over and over and over i mean really there's like an epidemic of this kind of thing and um and it's all because you know basically they're getting screwed by the central bank and the effects of those policies i mean Scott Horton, I'm looking forward to a night of wisdom, insight, hilarity, passion, you know. All it should be fun. I also will be watching the chat room. <laughs> <laughs> it should be great. We're counting on you guys. <laughs> All right. You know, hey, so, yeah, welcome to our show. It's Eye on the Empire with me, Scott Horton, and him, Jeffrey Tucker. Tell them about yourself there for a minute, Jeff. I am he, I, uh, the, 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 the uh, Jeffrey Tucker, jeffreytucker.me, liberty.me, CLO, uh, digital development, fee.org, uh, writer of, uh, summaries and introductions, Leslie Fair books, and 
I don't know what else, you know, just d doing the thing. Um, these days, you know, causing a lot of trouble by uh, apparently opposing uh, Trump against, you know, the, the uh, mainline bourgeoisie of the GOP, which is in a, in a nationalistic, fascistic frenzy that's out of control. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And I'm the editor of antiwar.com, and I do a radio show where I interview journalists about the wars. That's basically that's, it. That's, that's, that's you're so clear. I mean, who's more believable, you or me? I mean, you clearly have a more compelling, you know, sort of reductionist uh, Biograph bi biographical scotch. Well, so. Yeah. Okay. That's, so, the I, that's fine. I have a. I have a. I have a, I have a profound. I mean, that's just one part of it. Of course, there's the cost of the empire and the cost of the rest of the national government and whatever. But uh, what's happened basically is there are massive unseen forces screwing these people, and so they're upset. They're insecure. Whatever good job they had is gone. And then so, of course, you know, it's so much easier to blame trade with China or you know mexican immigration or something like yeah. that than to actually go and read rothbard and understand Dude. why there is a fake prosperity followed by a very real boom how this happens why it happens why it's good for the state and its cronies but bad for everybody else and and you know i don't know it's a, but you know did you ever read that book um i'm sorry you have to google it uh but the title of the book is "War is the Force That Gives." Uh, War is the yeah the hedges. War is the force that gives us meaning. Right. Mm -hmm. Did you read that book? Yeah, yeah, it's a great one. It really is. And I am no fan of Chris Hedges, but that book is yeah. Sad. I think it's a, I read that book. It's really awesome. But yeah. you, you know, you can. But in a sense, it's too narrowly drawn. In a in a sense, because I mean, what I'm sensing right now is all these calls for you know bringing back American greatness and that sort of stuff. It's like, given that people are feeling so crappy about their own lives, and which found a question, and it occurred to me today as I was driving along the road for no particular reason. Um, the U.S. is losing its status as the world economic superpower. You know, the rise of China, you know, uh, uh, you know India, the Far East, you know, global prosperity spreading all over the world. Uh, for the first time in, you know, 100 years, the U.S. is now being challenged fundamentally. Uh, um, we've got in, we've got you know U.S. incomes on the decline now. Twenty, thirty, forty years. I don't know if uh, stagnant U.S. incomes. You know a lot of resentment, but but basically you know you you've you've got so so that deep cultural presumption that's been alive for a hundred years that we're number one and uh, that we get to dictate the terms that nobody you know nobody can beat us. You know it's us versus the world. We're masters of the universe. This can't last that much longer, if if it's even alive now. So I'm just wondering, uh, in light of that, it, uh, how much do you think that this this what strikes me as like a very obvious reality is is playing into the politics of the moment? The you know, the, the sort of the the sense of of weirdo panic that you're getting at the core of American political life today with 